Hi there, welcome back to History of Graphic Narratives. In this lecture, we're going to look at what is called the Silver Age of American Comics. This is really a very important transformative period in American comics, coming out of the Comics Code, which placed this heavy restrictions on publishers to make sure the content was suitable for children. And yet they knew that they had an audience that was young adults and teens. And how are you going to engage an audience broader than the most obvious children? To begin with, let's look at the two major publishers who had survived the introduction of the Comics Code, DC and the newly minted Marvel Comics, uh, formerly known as Timely. Under the direction of Julius Schwartz, or Julie Schwartz, there was a return to the superhero. And not just any one superhero, but this idea of the superhero team. And the dynamic between the team was part of what made the story interesting. It wasn't just uh, a battle between a hero and a villain. It was often the sort of interesting kind of dynamic that played out among the heroes themselves. So the idea of the superhero team. Fantastic Four was a new creation uh, that had come into uh, Timely and, and had been there with, when Marvel uh, took off with this new uh, editor, Stan Lee. Stan Lee had been brought in who, as basically the, the comic business was dying. And he, in an act of desperation, decided to throw all caution to the wind and just make comics that he thought would be interesting. And indeed, that seemed to have paid off. Uh, Marvel, in his direction, really took on a, a whole new formula for the superhero. And this we call the wounded superhero. And that is, uh, the formula began with a scientist, some kind of outsider, someone who was a social outcast, uh, someone who's really intelligent, but also kind of concerned for things that were outside the normal and how they would get caught in some kind of accident. And they would be transformed with these superpowers. But the superpower was seen as a kind of weakness. It was seen as a kind of burden that they had to bear. It wasn't just, uh, whoa, gee, look, I'm super strong. And look at all the things I can do. And so this new wounded superhero kind of played into some of the ambivalences of this time uh, post-World War II. They sort of, what is the role of America? What is the role of the hero in this time? Now, Marvel was really focused on cutting costs. And so if you'll notice here, the standard panel, panel layout was this very strict three by three, nine panel grid, or two by three in some cases. And they literally had the panels printed on the artwork sheets. So there wasn't any sort of fancy, innovative paneling like you used to see with Will Eisner. There was this need to just tell stories, tell them fast, focus on action, focus on sound effects, and and really get the story going in a simple and direct way. Perhaps the most successful of the superheroes invented by Marvel, of course, was Spider-Man, uh, which was playing into this, this wounded superhero theme. But what was interesting about the Spider-Man was he wasn't your typical hero in the sense that he was this adult male. He was this high school kid who really was a kind of outcast geek. Uh, 
And this is a, really a very important formulation with this idea of geek culture coming into its fore. And this is a really important transformation and identity that the comics were really appealing to. Geeks liked comics. High school kids, outcasts, well, they weren't popular with girls. And so the Spider-Man, the spider, this kind of icky character, but also kind of cool, this is the character that really starts to pay off for Marvel in a big way. Now, Steve Ditko, he was a really extraordinary artist teaming up with Marvel, and he really understood the sort of psychological characteristics of drama. Uh, in his comics. He was able to really focus in on the action and really create this kind of internal drama that would drive the story. Stan Lee, as an editor, was pretty intrusive. He liked to sort of add his own comments into the comic. He kind of overwrote a lot of the dialogue that the artists were coming up with. He would come up with the name of the character and he would pass it off to the artist to kind of run with it. And so there's been a lot of debate over the years who actually did what to create which characters. Stan Lee initially shared the credit with the artists, but more and more as he became a kind of star of the Marvel Comics, he would start to go and do talks and lectures at colleges and be on the radio and, and do interviews. And he was really the promoting comics in a way that no other editor had done before. And so Stan Lee had started to really promote himself as the face of Marvel Comics. And most of the artists were pretty comfortable with that idea initially because to them, they were happy to do their work. But as Stan Lee's ego started to grow in this role, he also started to take more and more credit for the creation of the superheroes. And that's where a lot of tension began to foment between Stan Lee and the artists. Money, compensation, of course, uh, but also artistic recognition was really at the heart of a lot of the tensions between the artists and Stan Lee. Here's a really curious panel from a Spider-Man comic I want to call your attention to. This is uh, Frederick Jameson. Uh, this is Jameson, the editor, sort of channeling Frederick Wortham. He's the sort of editor who works with Peter Parker. He needs Peter Parker, but of course he is himself uh, a kind of fraught character who wants to make a villain of Spider-Man and by extension, the whole argument against superheroes. So he in turn is, is a character here that we are the older generation, the people who don't understand what comics and superheroes are all about. Here's an example of what's considered one of the greatest comics that have Spider-Man that Steve Gitko ever created. In this uh, Spider-Man 33, the story is not especially powerful, uh, but the drama he creates, Spider-Man trapped under this massive machine, is, it is sort of struggling to find the strength. And the use of water pouring down over him creates this kind of visual connection between all the panel. The coloring is really dramatic. And in the end, you turn the page and there's this massive strength that he demonstrates. The flowing water, this is really uh, an homage to uh, Will Eisner and his uh, influence on comics from the 1940s. And Steve Ditko, he really appreciated that sort of darker vein of the comic um, genre. So one of the big changes that was happening as these new superhero teams and new comics started coming out is that comic artists started to get recognized through what became known as comic conventions. Now, early on, they would be like in some hotel lobby, a couple dozen kids who wanted to get together and trade comics. 
who are having trouble um, completing their collections of Spider-Man or whatnot. And it's in these early comic conventions, occasionally they get this idea that they would invite one of their favorite artists to come and talk to them. And this was really great because the artists would arrive and they would be treated like heroes themselves. And this allowed them to go back to their publisher and say, we want our names on our comics. We want to get more recognition for what we do. And this is a really important change that's happening in comic culture. The comic readers are, for the most part, collectors of comics. They want to have that individual and personal connection to what's going on in the comic world. And they want to have a relationship with their comic artists that they are their favorites of. Jack Kirby is an artist who's been around for a long time. He goes back into the golden age of comics. But now in this day and age of the Silver Age, he really comes into his own. He always had a very dramatic style. He was always able to work insanely fast. And so he was able to kind of make some money by just being incredibly determined, hardworking artist who just cranked out tons of comics in a really dramatic way. Over time, he was able to raise his stature to the point where he was able to get a special raise so that he earned more for his comic pages. And it's really interesting what happens in this time period as he's earning a little bit more for his comic pages. He doesn't just take that money. He actually starts spending more time on his comic pages, creating and exploring a whole lot of really interesting artistic directions, including collage, where you start to see him integrating different kinds of pictures and photographs into his drawn pages. And then some really crazy and surreal sorts of visual effects. What he's most famous for, which develops during this time, is his spectacular black ink use, which becomes known as the Kirby Crackle, this sort of chrome-like uh, hallucinatory explosion of rippling black and white. This was a real departure from when inking was not supposed to call attention to itself. You wanted to create a kind of realistic depiction of space. And in here, he's really creating this very dramatic and powerful visual to go with really not that interesting stories. One of the influences on Jack Kirby can be seen with his clear awareness of what was going on in pop art. Take, for example, this panel from Battlefield Action number 40 that Roy Lichtenstein developed into his painting Takataka. Taka. Now, Jack Kirby seems to be looking at what Roy Lichtenstein's doing with his painting by sort of exaggerating the bold and creating stronger contrasts of uh, forms and sort of really focusing on the visual elements, except sort of exaggerating the visual elements of comics. So Roy Lichtenstein's point is to create something that's really absurd so that we are more aware of the Bende dots and the, the conventions of the language and the explosions, making it sort of impossible to see the illusion of the space. And Jack Kirby's response to that is to kind of, again, emphasize the visual and really pump up the drama of his comic pages in a really interesting take on Lichtenstein's bold graphic style. Perhaps the one character that Jack Kirby really excelled at in his Kirby Crackle was the Silver Surfer, this sort of moody, dark character that seemed brooding and, and isolated. And here we see him in one of the last pages that Jack Kirby drew from Marvel Comics, 
we see him kind of raging against the authorities that be. And indeed, Jack Kirby was mightily mad at Stan Lee for taking credit, as I mentioned before, but also just really not paying him what he was due for all that he created. And he could see that there were all these spinoffs and other things that Marvel Comics was making a lot of money on his ideas and his creations that he had no access to. One of the big spinoffs that came to television, the major competitor for comics in this time, was the TV show Batman, which really only ran for two seasons from 1966 to 1968. But it was enormously influential. It was just a huge TV hit. And Adam West, in this sort of paunchy, deadpan, really characterized this sort of camp approach to comics that everyone just thought was hilarious. Now, for most comic book fans, the TV show was an embarrassment. It just highlighted all the things they hated about comics. But it proved so popular to such a wide audience that the editors at DC just couldn't help themselves to start to use these sort of exaggerated, absurd theatrics that were found in the TV show, much to the uh, distress and embarrassment of the longtime fans of Batman. The superhero was really having a rough time at finding a place in the world. Marvel Comics continued to spin out all kinds of variations on these heroes. Um, the Daredevil was probably one of their more imaginative takes, the idea of a superhero who was blind, such that the wounded hero now really has a disability that gives him a sort of different kind of strength and, for, and focus. Notice how in the top left corner here that Marvel is now selling its comics as pop art. Okay, this is Stan Lee's sort of ironic and, and no to cynical take on the whole movement of pop art. Also, Stan Lee's name starts appearing on the cover even more prominently than any of the artists. So the artists' are, names are on the inside cover at this time, if they're there at all. And so Stan Lee proudly presents the She-Hulk. So this is a number one collector's item issue. Again, they're recognizing collectors are their audience. And so they start spinning off all these sort of variations and really trying to hook in their devoted fan base with number ones, uh, new characters or new variations on established characters. One of the surprise hits that emerged in the 70s was a really interesting character by the name of Howard the Duck. Steve Gerber was a pretty typical writer for comics. And in one moment, while writing a really uninspired script for an action-adventure comic, he just sort of had this human duck character, sort of like Carl Barks, Donald Duck, sort of walk in and, and begin to tell the hero off for complaining so much. And this just really riveted the audiences. Who was this duck character? They wanted more duck. Now, the editors at Marvel were like, this is too weird. You got to get rid of the duck. And so in the next episode, we have uh, the duck sort of unceremoniously slipping off this edge and disappearing into a void. They're not going to have a duck. But this was too much for the fans at Marvel, and they really demanded that Howard the Duck 
return, okay? In fact, he didn't really have a name, and he was just sort of this duck character. So he they gave him the name Howard the Duck, and he has this great tagline, trapped in a world he never made. And this was probably the most sensational comic introduction of this period. Uh, it was really different. It was this funny animal character who was sort of a comic relief to an adventure comic. And it was a wonderful idea of kind of mixing up the genres in a way that no one had really tried before. And this became the impetus for a whole series of comics. Now, Steve Gerber, the writer for Howard the Duck, was not a great workaholic. He was always late getting his scripts in. He had a difficult time. And he was very contentious with the editors because he was he was noticing that they were making money um, and spinoffs uh, in the newspaper and on radio uh, for his creation. So he sued Marvel Comics and he was kicked out, blacklisted for fighting for more creative control over his creation, Howard the Duck. And he could really argue that Howard the Duck really was his creation. It wasn't just work for hire. For Marvel, he had kind of made that up on a lark. Anyways, didn't go well for Steve Gerber. The comic ended abruptly. No other artist took it on. And there have been a few revivals, but it's never really caught on in any great measure. So Gerber sues Marvel in 1978. And that was 79, the end of the Howard Duck comic. And, and they had already penned a deal with Steven Spielberg to make this Howard the Duck movie that came out in 1986, which was probably the most spectacular flop that Spielberg ever made. And it's really not even funny. It's so weird. Unless you are a person who is keen on self-punishment, I would not recommend the movie. So, in review, who first used the term Silver Age? Well, the Silver Age was really the ideas of the traders at the comic conventions. They wanted to distinguish the new comics that they were collecting from the old comics pre-comics code, which were considered gold age and more valuable because they were so rare. So how were superhero comics in the 1960s different from those made 20 years earlier? Well, the 1960s, like I say, the comics code really changed the focus. And uh, re there was a resurgence in the superhero at this time, which had been losing steam in the 1950s. And there was this approach to comics where there was this sort of internal psychological drama, which then became a kind of ironic, and a little bit sarcastic take on the comic industry as they were trying to appeal to older, geeky audiences. What influence did comic book conventions have on the comic book industry? Well, like I said, though, even the whole term, the Silver Age, is a part of that idea that there is this sort of value added to the golden age, this older, and that's part of these conventions made up of collectors. The other important thing was the fandom brought attention to the artists in the industry, and the fandom, you know, demanded things happen, like Howard the Duck. So what possibly prompted Jack Kirby's new style? So in the Silver Age, Jack Kirby gets... Uh, bonus. He's able to spend more time on his comic pages. And so that's part of what's going on. But a, another part is his own response to pop art, where he's going to start to introduce this new bold, vivid graphic style to his pages, make them into art as he sees art. How did Camp come to Silver Age com comics? Well, the Batman TV show really introduces the idea. The comics had always had, at this time, a little bit of self-awareness and irony, but the Batman comics really just sort of pushed that idea over the edge. 
into even more outrageous forms of absurdity.